find out who walked that road. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the sustaining grace. We thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the cleansing blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Anoint us with your Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Cleansing goes back to an old English word. Really, it means to make pure. Right. Cleansing is, a, is how the old English word was spelled. But we find, as we look at this, a very powerful story about the purging of our sins. Isaiah was one of the, well, the greatest, I would say, prophet in the Bible. And he is referred to as the Prince of the Old Testament Prophets. His name also describes exactly what this Isaiah, the book of Isaiah is all about. Salvation is from the Lord. Period. Salvation comes from Jehovah, from God. And that's what his name meant. That's what it means. Salvation is from God. Now, chronologically and logically speaking, the book of Isaiah starts with chapter 6. If you go ahead and do some research on it, you'll find that theologians agree. This is actually the beginning of the book of Isaiah. And we find in the year of the death of King Uzziah. Uzziah's father was martyred, um, massacred, assassinated, I guess I should say. And so at the age of 16, he became king. He set out to deal with all of his dad's enemies. And he defeated the Edomites, who had been a, an enemy for some 80 years. And he defeated them. He also defeated the Arabs of Gerbeth, and he also defeated the Philistines. He leveled their cities, the city of Gath, the city of Ashdod, he leveled them and established his own fortified cities. And you'll find all this in the book of Chronicles, we'll not go there. But he had some very uh, wise people among his ranks, who, and some were inventors, some were, uh, and so they came up with this thing called the ballista, where we get our word ballistics from, and it was a device that could cast a stone as much as 300 pounds. Also, had a device that would cast an arrow, some a quarter of a mile, and built these uh, ram, uh, battering rams to knock down walls and so forth and so on. He had some 300,000 men, soldiers, he was feared all the way to the gates of Egypt. So he was the hero of his day. He was the source of comfort. He was the strength and everybody stood behind him. And they were so, they were so satisfied and so happy to have him as king. But he died. He became a bit arrogant and he went into the temple to offer up his own sacrifice. And when the priest tried to hinder him, he raised his hand against the priest. Immediately he was struck with leprosy and his whole body became like snow. And he died a lonesome death by himself in a leper's house. So the pride of Israel is now gone. The whole nation is sad. Flags at half mass, so to speak. When everybody thought, everybody thought, Lord, what in the world? How did you let this happen? Did, don't you know he was a great warrior for our land? And a man broken in spirit, who no doubt loved Uzziah, made his way up to the temple. A man named Isaiah. Having lost all hope, all expectation, he journeys his way up to the temple. The glow, the glory has gone. Their hero has fallen. They stand 
naked before the enemies, so to speak. As he's sitting there in the chapel, he's pondering perhaps why. He's pondering perhaps all those wonderful things that have happened that he's done for our land. Just one little hiccup and, and he's gone. He's sad. And then, and then comes verse 1, chapter 6. I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. In the darkness of the darkest hour, the brightest profound truth came forth, and the glory of God did come forth, and he saw the Lord. So something of significance happened. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and knitted up, and his train filled the temple. At this moment, a great transformation took place in the life of Isaiah. Now I remind you that Isaiah is filled with prophecy. Some 66 times it's quoted in the book of in the New Testament. If you go to chapter 9, it talks about, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. All about the coming Messiah. And so the, the book of Isaiah is heavy with proof. Do you know why God gives us prophecy? So that group defeated many, many a city, many, many people. Brings his army up to the walls of Jerusalem. He's threatening Hezekiah. And God says to Hezekiah, don't you worry about this guy. He's not going to be, he's not going to even be allowed to shoot an arrow across the walls of Jerusalem. That night, thousands of his men perished. The few surviving fled, and that's what happened. Now, why the book of Isaiah? Why the books of prophecy? We'll find that out. What transformed Moses' life? Now, Moses had committed murder. He had fled. He was hiding in the wilderness. And he's pondering how horrible it was back in Egypt and how his adopted family, the word of people doing all this. And in his darkest moment from some 40 years, and lo and behold, a burning bush. Transformed, wasn't he? A man named Saul, him known as Paul, on the road to Damascus, transformed. He was one day killing Christians. And the very next day, preaching the gospel. That's what you call conversion. We live in a culture today where conversion is not a reality among a lot of people. They just add Christ to their vocabulary, and that's all that happens. No change, no transformation. Matthew tells us, chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart. You understand that? Your heart is very, very pure with the Lord. You have a genuine, sincere heart for righteousness. When sin creeps up, you confess it and ask the Lord to forgive you. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're a born-again Christian, if you love the Lord, if you, you should be quoting that verse every day. Because there's not a day goes by that Satan doesn't tempt us. And when he tempts us to sin, this is a promise to the believers. Okay? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay? Hebrews says, we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. Moses, Paul, Isaiah, Nathan, folks on the road to Damascus, they witnessed and they were changed. 
They witnessed and they were changed. We live in a culture today where immorality is embraced. I heard uh, Adrian Rogers say this. I'll share it with Premier Eaton the other night. He said, do you know why the cults are doing so well and why people get involved in them? He says, this guy sitting in his den, his couch is covered with pornography of magazines. The room is filled with the aroma from whatever he's smoking on. Sitting by him is a six pack of formaldehyde or antifreeze, you might call it. And he's just lapping himself in deep sin. And there's a knock at the door. And two Jehovah's Witnesses are standing there and they say, we want to come and tell you how there is there is no hell. Come right on in. You're just a guy I want to hear. That's where we live today. No consequences of sin. No reality of the awfulness of it. A, a lack of understanding of the of the profoundness of the glory of our Lord and Savior. So then we go into the text and we find chapter 6, verse 2 through verse 4. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. Meaning, the seraphims are, if you go into the Bible study, they're all about purging of sin. The seraphims bring to our attention our guilt. Our sins. Our conscience becomes aware of our sins. And so Seraphim doesn't show his face. All of a sudden he's there and his feet are covered. But he has his wings. And the Seraphim brings about conviction. And so there's a cleansing. Verse 3. When cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the doors did move, and the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Psalms 19 verse 7 says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now how do we get the Bible? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. What is it that brings us under conviction? It is the power of the Holy Spirit. We find here in, the, uh, in that chapter, if you read on, it talks about um, the issue of sin. And, and a verse I would encourage you to memorize. I've memorized this verse since I was a little fellow. It's in Psalms 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Ever since I was five years old. Every Sunday night when we had our youth gathering, we had to recite that verse. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, or my strength and my redeemer. So we come to the confession. The seraphims surrounding the throne, the post shake, the whole earth is filled with his glory. And then in verse 5, verse 5. Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Notice that. And I dwell in the midst of a people of what? Unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the host of glory. Confession. Confession. Interesting is about the lips. You know, we had a, a stinging cold weather recently, got down to 19 degrees. And I couldn't find my chapstick. <laughs> and my lips got chapped. And then a piece of loose skin was hanging on the inside of my mouth. And I carelessly caught it with my teeth as it pulled it. I quit doing that real quick. <laughs> It hurt. And my daughter came out with Udabon. Any of y'all know anything about Udabon? That's what we used on cows when the udder got chapped. 
we put it on there, and it's the best list of the, the best, okay? And so that's what she has, and I got some. It's interesting how this deals with the issue, okay? Dealing with the lips, the mouth, the cleansing. Now notice what the seraphim does in verse 6. One of them, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, hot, glowing coal. Verse 7. He laid it upon my mouth. And this is what I said. Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Notice that. Around the throne of God, seraphim. The seraphim name comes from seraphim, and it means to burn. To burn. The sin offering. Go back to the Old Testament. The sin offering was always about the burning. Okay? The seraphim searches out the sin in our lives. And the sin is cleansed and purged there in verse number 7. Thy sin is purged. Interesting connection in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, listen carefully. Who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, talking about Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, and upholding all things of the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. Christ. Period. Give a mind to go, a mind to go in California. You wouldn't believe how teeny that little speck of gold was. We have it stashed away somewhere in the house. But if you get enough gold, the goldsmith wants to purify it. So he heats it up to burn off any of the impurities. I'm told when that little bubble of gold, which is now liquefied, is pure, then it establishes a mirror on the surface, a reflection. When you see yourself in Christ, you're pure. All that's washed away. It's important, okay? The cleansing power in verse 7. Lo, thou hast touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. The number one thing in your life. Flip back to chapter 5, verse 24. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the shaft, so their root shall be as rottenness. Their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of God of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. But notice, go back, referring to fire. When a person really becomes a, when a person becomes a Christian, it's because of the burning sensation of guilt and the realization of judgment and a desire to be purged, cleansed, redeemed. And that becomes the one, number one thing in life. Chapter 9 of Isaiah verse 18 has these words to say to us. For wickedness burneth as the fire, it shall be devoured, it shall devour the briars and the thorns, and shall, and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest. Fire, burning, sensation, cleansing. It must be, there must be a burning sensation of the guilt and the awfulness of sin for one to become a born-again Christian and trust Christ, who is the one who Purges us. It's important that you realize 
that you're in an ongoing conflict in life. Satan wants to destroy you. Satan is after you. There is a, there is a, a con constant conflict. Satan wants to destroy your testimony. He wants you to do just, 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 this won't hurt much, just, just a little bit, and then, and then, and then. Notice what it says in Isaiah, going back to chapter 6, verse 8. Chapter 6, verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Notice what someone's heart has been cured of sin and has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that marvelous relief of guilt is washed away and you stand not in guilt but in, in a sense of righteousness in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In his arena you stand. Here is what comes forth out of your heart. Okay? I, here I am, send me. Once the Lord purges us of our sin. Let me read to you a few verses from the book of Acts. Chapter 28, verse 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Spirit to his heirs. We're right back to where we are in chapter 6, being quoted here in the book of Acts, chapter 28. Saying, go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax dross. That's where we are today. That's exactly where much of our culture is today. Waxed over. You know, let me say this with you. God's longing desire to declare his mind and will to the people through his willing servant is what his plea is today. <clears throat> Twenty-five times alone, just in the book of Ezekiel, you will find events described. For example, in chapter 37, and verse 13, talks about the dry bones. Israel became a place of dry bones. A place unfit for habitation. Back in the 1800s. Today it is flourishing. Great exporter of food. The greatest exporter of salt. Becoming the greatest exporter of natural gas. In that parable it talks about how there were dry bones and then there's flesh being added to them. And in that prophecy it says, and all this, and this is found 25 times, okay, 5 to 5 to 5, 25, 25 times alone in the book of Ezekiel we find these things happen for a very specific reason. I'll read to you. Isaiah 37 verse 13. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. That's one. All the way through, in, in Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 9, verse 16, verse 21, chapter 30, verse 8, verse 19, verse 25, verse 26, chapter 32, verse 15, verse 29, all the way down. These things happen. Why? That they, for they shall know I am the Lord. Period. So why do things happen that were prophesied and then they're fulfilled that those who will take note of will know, will know. Here's a very good promise in chapter, in Isaiah 37 and verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves. Why? I have a collection of sorrow. Nobody knows where it is. I know where it is. When I go to certain graves, 
people that are dear to me have passed away. Get a little teeny handful of sorrow. Just to sort of lighten the load for that day when the Lord comes to resurrect them. I stood over the grave of Kenny Buckethus this past week. I thanked the Lord that what I read gave his date of death in 2022 and not 1961. He was the one I threw in the ocean because I was rebelling against God. Didn't want to be a preacher. Hanging out the wrong crowd. And he became intoxicated. I wanted to sober him up try to, so I could take him home to be with my brother and his brother. So I threw him in, in the ocean of folly and the wave knocked me down. It was midnight, April 1961, full moon. And I woke God up and then he was gone and I could not find him and I could not find him and I could not find him. And I began to scream and cry and holler, began to flounder around the war. And after the third wave, I saw some sparkling blood bubbles. I grabbed it, it was his wristwatch. He lived, and I went to Bible college, and that's why I'm in this pulpit today. Amen. God got my attention. Amen. Had I not found him, guess what would be written on his tomb today? Amen. April 1961. Amen. And so... The Lord is going to open these graves. Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. I hope you do. It tells us right here, simple and clear in verse 12. He's going to open graves. In verse 13, why? That my people might know that I'm the Lord. Period. My people might know I'm the Lord. And so what does he do? He says, go and tell the people. I was asked last night, how long have you been a pastor? August the 26, 1962. I'm very, very, very humbled to know that God has allowed me to share his message through these years. And it's simply put right here to every born-again believer whose sins have been washed away, Go and tell the people. Just go and tell the people. Let them know. So that they may know that I am God. What is it? Psalm 100. Make a, a joyful noise of the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with thanksgiving. I cannot imagine what was it like, but I'm sure they were just about to jump out of their skin when those boys came back and told Jacob that Joseph was alive. Can you imagine that? Fred Connor, World War II, ship was sunk by a German submarine. He jumped overboard in a pool of oil leaking from that ship was rescued by a French vessel. He was covered with black oil. He was reported as an African American being recovered. He was solid black. His family received word that he did not survive this in action. The day that the check came to his parents' house for his passing away, Craig Common walked up and knocked on the door. Can you imagine that? How excited they were. Here's a check for his death, and there he stands. That's what this resurrection is all about. That they may not, they may know. It's important. As we live in a day when it is eyes and ears are glossed over and people are not listening. I share the gospel and talk to folks about the Lord, and so many of them you can tell they're just not listening. This is not of interest to them. After all, they just got themselves a nice yoke of oxen. No, I just got married. I got a new wife. I don't have time for that. And on and on the excuses, excuses went. And so he said, go out into the highways and byways. 
find people who will listen. And that's what we do at Trinity Bible Church. Amen. Amen. That's not who drives a big car. And if you drive a big car, that's fine. And if you don't want it to be, that's, that's great. But it's not all about that. It's our sharing the gospel with people. Next, now this is a miracle. Next Saturday morning at 7.30, Michael Cornell is going to give his devotion. Right? Yes, sir. Now, he says if he hopes the Lord will come, Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would pray for when I preach my first sermon. <laughs> right here at his mother's funeral, I heard him pray in the men's prayer breakfast one Saturday morning. Wow. All of them said, man, you do that. And so what did I do? Well, what the Lord left my heart to do? He came here doing his mother's funeral and prayed. You see, it's amazing how God works. And where we need to work is among people who will listen, but be aware of the fact in the last days, people's ears are waxed over, eyes are waxed over, they do not have any desire to hear. But that's okay. That's okay. That's the reality we live in. Just keep on keeping on. And you find some 25 times in the book of Ezekiel, all these things happen for one specific reason. God said, this will happen, it happened. God said, this will happen, this will happen. He did it all for one specific reason. And he said, when you walk up, next time you walk up to a grave, and you know the person is a born again Christian has passed away, just stand and think. Days will come and this, this grave will go erupt. And uh, that person will come out. Okay? And why? Tell us, they have prophecy, so that all will come to a realization, whether it's soon enough or too late. They shall know. They shall know. I am God. Make a joyful noise of the Lord, O ye land. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord, He is God. He made us. We're not, a, not of ourselves. We're his people. We're the sheep of his pasture. Entering into his straight gates with thanksgiving and with praise. Be thankful for the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And his, you know, his mercy endureth forever. His truth endureth unto all generations. Amen. Amen. Now there was a time when folks would say, if you believe the earth is around, you cuckoo. And there have been people who said things about Christians and their people. But what I have been preaching for the last 60 years will be preached until the Lord comes. The Word of God. Amen. And we may know. We may know. We may know. In the book of Numbers, it talks about how the children of Israel were led into the wilderness. They were there for 40 years. They were dealt with there. God dealt with them, but it was all so that they might know. They might know. And leave with you this last verse. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God who, in sundrous, God who at sundrous times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. What did they say? Verse 8. But unto, but unto the Son he saith, Thy throne. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. If you are serving and living and looking to the day of the Lord's coming and his kingdom, you'll not be a loser. You'll not be on the losing team. Amen. God has blessed Trinity Bible Church. God is blessing this church. I'm very thankful for the purity of our people who have sincere hearts. We came out in the rain this morning. Drove up. I'm very thankful for those whose hearts are committed 
those who have come to realization, realization, yes, they know, we know, the Lord is God. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Speak to our hearts. May the Holy Spirit have charge of our lives. May, Lord, we, we even as Isaiah step forward and say, yes, Lord, use me. Yes, Lord, send me. Yes, Lord, let me be a part of this wonderful, wonderful cause. Others might come to Christ as their Savior. And on all of our missionaries who serve you, we pray, God, that you'll be with Peter and Melody as they serve you and all the other missionaries. Anoint them with your spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Song that will come and close our service in the song.